Thank you so much, Terry and Louise. It's, it's such a treat to be here. I remember spending many a Tuesday lunch hour in this exact room you know, 10 years ago. So thank you for, for entertaining me here. Um, it has been a long time since I've done this research, so please keep in mind that I'm, I'm going to be talking about this with very high level uh, results and maybe um, spend a little bit of time talking about where where water resource management and NGO participation in West Africa is, is currently, given all of the instability that they've been facing over the past several years. So <clears throat> um, one of the things that I, I, I learned through this, this project um, was that sometimes international development can be really, really messy. And um, although I, some of these findings may feel a little bit negative, I just want to stress that there are a lot of people working in the West Africa Water Initiative with really excellent intentions and doing phenomenal work. But um, I think some experiences, you know, reflecting on these experiences 10 years later kind of demonstrates the good and the bad and the ugly that can happen in these really large international partnerships. And there are some valuable lessons that we can learn from that. And I think uh, every single partner who is sitting around the table for our uh, semi-annual headquarters meetings from these organizations uh, definitely took that with them uh, after the partnership ended as well. So um, I hope you'll just take that with a grain of salt. And um, here, we, here we go. Let's talk about Mali. Has anybody done work in Mali or know anything about West Africa? Not really? All right. Well, great. OK. <laughs> Not the easiest place to work. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it'll, Mali itself um, is about twice the size of Texas. It's landlocked. Um, it, vast parts of it are uh, non-arable. So maybe 5% maybe of the land is arable. There's 19 million people in Mali, and uh, about half of them live below the extreme poverty line of $1.90 a day. I think that's still the extreme poverty line. Um, <clears throat> but the, the thing about Mali is that it, it has substantial groundwater supplies. It has really strong uh, uh, renewable internal available water resources, about double the, uh, the um, minimum livelihood threshold globally. So, um, but the challenges are around equitable access and the sustainable management of those resources, which place it uh, pr uh, pretty poorly on the water, deep water poverty index and, and other things like that. So um, about 78% of the, the population now has access to basic water coverage. Um, that, they've restructured some of the phrasing around water access. Uh, and it's even changed in the last 10 years. But basic water co um, coverage refers to drinking water from an improved source, provided collection time is not more than 30 minutes for a round trip, including queuing up for that water. So these are people who are collecting water from boreholes with hand pumps, um, hand dug wells, that sort of thing. I'll show you some pictures a little bit later. Um, but uh, water in the country is actually made, access to water has made huge strides over the last 20 years. Uh, we've shifted from about 50% of people in 2003 not having access to basic water to about 50%, um, or 25%, pardon me, 50% to 25%, uh, which is pretty substantial. And a lot of that was because of the, the uh, work done by um, agencies that came together after the Millennium Development Goals were established. So I, I did a historical survey of the water management uh, activities across the country, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of very basic points. First off is that village leadership, traditional village leadership, plays a very central role in, in all resource management, ma management, but especially for water resources at the community level, uh, making decisions around the placement of water points, so on and so forth. And when the government um, came in, in in the 80s, there was um, extreme drought in the region in the 70s and 80s. 
uh, government came in and they plunged a whole bunch of boreholes across the country to give communities access, much needed access. This was humanitarian response, really, um, but a government-funded program. Um, uh, at that time, there was no such thing as creating water and sanitation committees who would help oversee those water points. Um, there was not a lot of thought into the sustainability of those water points. Um, and a number of those boreholes that the government drilled were actually supposed to be a, a groundwater monitoring uh, platform where they come back and, and monitor the groundwater supplies across the country, um, especially during times of drought. But even 15 years later, um, most of those were in disrepair and they have never followed up since on that as, as far as I'm aware of. So with foreign support to lay the groundwork, um, Mali's government adopted a National Integrated Water Resource Plan in 2008. But because of lack of funding uh, in government administrations, they can't really implement anything. So they rely quite heavily on um, NGO uh, interventions across the country in the water sector. Um, the challenge is that since, since around 2011, 2012, maybe you remember seeing this on Al Jazeera, BBC, uh, NPR, Mali faced a, a, a very serious food crisis and then uh, challenges with some of the Islamist movements that were moving into the region or, or they were always in the region but really ramping up their, their activities. Um, there was a coup d'etat in the government, uh, removal of the, the president by uh, military powers, um, just there was a political and an institutional crisis across the country. Uh, this, this all started in the northern regions um, where those, those areas of extreme food insecurity was happening um, and that's where the Islamist movements were coming in. But it really spread like wildfire throughout the country and even in, in the area where I worked in south central Mali um, was affected by that. Even while I was doing research there were military base attacks in 2008, an hour, hour and a half away from where I was working. Um, and you know, up to the point now that there's even instability in the, the southern capital, Bamako. So really, it's, um, this has permeated daily life for Malians across the country. And just like in the, the 70s and 80s, when there was the, the, the uh, drought crises and the response to it, uh, he, emergency humanitarian aid has been rolling back in into Mali. And, um, Mali, Mali has a huge network of NGOs, international NGOs, but what's happened is these NGOs have had to completely shift their priorities from a developmental approach to community development to now humanitarian response. So that's also one of the things that I'll come back to at the end of this talk. So a little bit about the West Africa Water Initiative. It was put together by 13 global partners who, uh, after the Millennium Development Goals were established, wanted to take a closer look at the link between public health and water across the Sahal. So this, this group of 13 organizations, most of the funding came from USAID um, and the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. Um, and then World Vision really became one of the core implementing agencies because they had been working in these regions, Ghana, Niger, Mali for a long time, especially Mali and Ghana. And they had really well established networks. They had local staff in communities across the countries. So it made sense for them to be a, a, you know, central drivers of the process, of, of the projects throughout the WAWI initiative. Um, there are a lot of other partners, including WaterAid, Windrock, uh, Windrock working on uh, Guta Gut drip irrigation, and um, CFAD. So Cornell University was was uh, looking at a lot of the um, water projects and agricultural projects as well. But we we were much smaller players. We were important parts of the team, but we were much smaller players than the the three listed up top. And at the time, it was led by a central secretariat. It was a five-year initiative back then. They had four key objectives, 
providing safe, sustainable water, of course, reducing waterborne diseases, so on and so forth. They drilled over 700 boreholes and constructed about 8,200 latrines. They did um, water sanitation hygiene training for communities. They set up water and sanitation committees uh, and, and worked on trainings with them. And again, this is very much uh, a thrust behind all the, the, the stuff that World Vision was doing and building on a lot of their existing work with the support of all of us partners. Um, they developed women's gardens, uh, the drip irrigation I mentioned, um, and again, Cornell, we worked out, uh, set, we assessed projects, water projects and agricultural projects. And actually, through our funding, we also supported a lot of research happening at institutions, research institutions across Mali and Ghana. So that was, um, you know, I'm pretty proud of the, the work that Cornell did with that. <clears throat> While we uh, decided to go into a, a second phase, it, it, to this day, it is still very fuzzy what happened in the second phase and how much actually was accomplished. Um, what they did is they, they decided that, that that last priority I had up on the screen, which was about uh, partnership synergy, we, that we failed pretty epically at that as a as a collaboration, um, and it really dropped to the off the radar for all the organizations and involved. Um, but they decided to give Huawei kind of a, a Huawei 2.0 uh, a try, but it uh, shifted the focus a little bit, but mostly in that the funding wasn't going to be spread around so much. It was going to go to three main agencies. Um, UNICEF, I think WaterAid and, and World Vision. And then USAID was, so that was Hilton Foundation, and then USAID was gonna take money in and offer smaller grants for smaller targeted initiatives. But they were kind of, they, they almost created bigger silos than we even had before, the way that we worked. So my core research was looking at the historical, I'll back up a little bit because uh, Louise mentioned that I was an engineer by training and I was really interested in trying to better understand you know, the ecological and the, the human impacts of technical design. What I, I started to thinking about started to think about everything in terms of systems and systems approaches. So I wanted to take a step back and, and really try to understand all the moving pieces of a collaboration like the West Africa Water Initiative and how those might impact um, the functionality of water and sanitation committees in rural communities in this initiative, uh, try to figure out the power imbalances between people, try to understand uh, the, the gender inequities or, or opportunities for empowerment across the initiative with really um, putting the household level front and center, but, but making sure that I was looking at everything from household to national level policy. Um, so I was looking at perceptions, development projects, um, impacts of intervention design and on households, and then, as I mentioned, the role of gender. So the region that I was working in, Segu, I really wish Erica Steiger was here because I have some follow-up questions about the current state of, um, of what's happening in Mali, and she worked up in Tombuktu for a long time. Um, but uh, I was in South Central Mali. It's very dry there. It's, uh, it, what you need to know is it barely rains. So five, 600 millimeters annually. It comes basically in a two-month period during our summer, it's intense. I was working in, I did a deep dive in nine communities in that, that area. Um, so these communities were primarily Muslim um, and animist. Uh, they uh, were entirely agrarian, almost entirely subsistence farmers, a little bit of small trading, uh, millet and sorghum, groundnuts, that sort of thing. A lot of men, mostly men, would migrate for employment uh, to places like Bamako or even as far as working in the ports in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and, and no matter who you spoke to, it was immediately apparent that water was just so central to everyday life. So uh, you, you, you can't talk to anybody in Mali without uh, really 
really knowing that that's a key part of uh, well-being well -being and uh, conservation across the country. Um, I don't want to go too much into this, my methodology or anything, but I just wanted to point out again that um, my research really tried to peel back different layers of understanding between collaborative resource management. So I, I, was, I, had, I had a strategy behind this process. Um, one of the things that working in a new environment like West Africa is there's cultural nuances and I, no matter what, I'm an outsider and I, I don't know everything. So I, I really tried to be purposive in how I went through the interview process, gathered my preliminary data, and then triangulated. I did uh, deep dives into house with 80 individual households, in addition to water and sanitation committee members, government officials, traditional leadership, local NGO staff, national NGO staff, uh, you name it. Um, then in most of my research took place between 2006, 2010. Uh, the most intense period of uh, field work, though, was in 2008. Um, I've already talked a little bit about um, the traditional authority, and uh, you might have seen on one of those previous slides that Mali is a country that's seen some pretty radical shifts in governance. Um, you know, ba back in many, many, many thousands of years ago, onto colonialism and then went through these really dramatic shifts of um, uh, democratization and you know the extremes of, of that uh, and level of authority government authority so there's not a lot of trust in in post-colonial governance in the country because of because of that really um, instability like uh, the droughts of uh, the 70s and 80s and the current political crises now just perpetuates all of that, right? But I wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about the decentralization process. And when you think of the word decentralization in, in Bambara, the main, the primary local language is like, there are a lot of different local languages across Mali, but this is the primary one. Um, Decentralization means returning the power to the home in which it came from. But the Constitution uh, doesn't fall in line with that technical, tra that like um, actual translation. It's more about returning power to the periphery. So they're talking about, um, through the decentralization process, returning power to um, communes and, uh, you know, um, elected administrations that are not part of the traditional leadership environment that Malians still have a lot of trust in and in the rural areas especially. Um, so, so you still have that kind of constant, constant challenge um, feeding that distrust and, um, you know, when you have coup d'etats and drastic shifts in governance, it just builds on that um, post-colonial rule in a country like Mali. Of course, it's a lot more complex than that, but there, there's my one-minute summary, right? Um, so just quickly looking at women and water, you probably already know this, but women are the primary water collectors in a country like uh, Mali. Uh, they're responsible for gathering it for all household use. They have a fair amount of power making decisions around water use in the household. But in, in South Central Mali, women don't really participate in public spheres of decision making. So that's the space for men. They may sit there and be present, but they're there not to speak. Um, there's also hierarchies among women. So for water collection, if, if you're in a household with several relatives, if you're the daughter-in-law, you got the short end of the stick because you are the one doing all the water collection for the 12, 13, 14, 15 people in your household, your, your household compound. That's, that's a lot of work for young women. Men make the decisions on where they're going to plunk down the boreholes and dig the wells. Uh, they use water for building and repair. Um, they're the ones feeding larger livestock, or actually it's the boys feeding livestock. And really that's about it. Yeah. So I'm gonna 
do a little rapid fire of some of the results that I found uh, from my research. And basically, not a lot of uh, boreholes with hand pumps and foot pumps operating anymore, you know, at the time. And that's even boreholes that were, were drilled and had been in place for maybe two years, three years, they broke down. Um, there was confusion among you know, who is responsible for repairing, uh, water and sanitation committees. Um, many people didn't necessarily understand their roles because you're having um, an NGO come in and say, okay, village leadership, we need a, a water and sanitation committee and we need 50% men, 50% women. But that you know, it goes against everything in a, in a traditional community-based organization. They, these communities have had CBOs, community-based organizations, for hundreds of years. And they're still functioning, you know, they're not perfect, and I'm generalizing, but, you know, they function well, but they're, te they're gendered. So you'll have a women's committee, you'll have a men's committee, you'll have a youth committee, that sort of thing. But when we come in for a water project, we don't usually tap into those existing structures. We come in and we say we want water and sanitation committee with 50% women, 50% men. It doesn't always work. So... Um, these people are often selected um, regardless of whether or not they have the bandwidth or the desire to do it. They, they have just total faith in the traditional leadership to say, okay, Kim, you're, you'd be well suited for this role. You know how to read and write. Um, it's all yours. But maybe I don't want to, maybe I, don't, I can't do it. I, I've got, you know, six kids at home. So we also tend to uh, underestimate the power of women in the household as well. Um, while, uh, while men are making a lot of the decisions in a community, women have a lot of influence in the household in, in South Central Mali. And I think that's also something that um, we're, not, we're not respecting enough uh, in a lot of our development projects. Um, we also, we, we treat our, our men and women as homogenous, and they're really not. Like, there's a lot of, there are lots of power imbalances uh, within um, men's groups and, and within uh, households for women, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, there's just also a strong reliance and in, in trust for a lot of traditional reasons in your, your traditional leadership. <clears throat> so with external partners, um, there's really limited incorporation of traditional knowledge. And while I was there, to be quite honest, with 13 organizations, let alone the research institutions we were working with and other, other partners, we really didn't know where anybody was working. So I'd be out in the field for, for months, and I wouldn't know that there were UNICEF staff, you know, uh, 10 miles down the road working on hygiene training in uh, primary schools. So um, knowledge management was something and just uh, making sure everybody was, was aware of what was happening in the field was a very challenging thing when you have all of these uh, massive organizations um, trying to work on the same project. Um, just very quickly, uh, additional things that I saw, gardens were popping up everywhere. Um, you know, it's a very dry place, but uh, having boreholes also allowed um, uh, an increase in gardens. I also saw a large number of boys collecting water, which was so surprising because this is a women's job. Women's job in uh, this part of the world. And it was really because, um, and the community members described it to me, and, and they felt like having a hand pump or a foot pump, especially a shiny new hand pump, was like new technology in the community. So that was kind of flashy and cool for the boys to, to take part in. And then if you happen to have a household that had a bicycle or bidons, the, the canola oil containers, or if you were lucky enough to have a charrette um, donkey cart, then the guys were on it. So, um, so that was very just, you know, a small, it was a really small finding, but, you know, interesting. 
<clears throat> so I saw a lot of really great opportunities um, to really use, again, some of those traditional uh, trusted community-based organizations, often gendered, instead of uh, token assignments in water and sanitation committees. I'll say I, I can't tell you how many uh, women treasurers on water and sanitation committees, and women, women were treasurers because common knowledge, men have a lot of responsibilities and tough, you know, tough duties it would be so easy to take that money and go spend it on something else. So women, women were tasked with holding the money <clears throat> for maintenance and for repairs. But I only remember one treasurer, one woman treasurer, who actually knew where the money was. So, it, I mean, it's, it's just astounding. Um, also, I found... Uh, the, the, uh, the committees also really wanted to do their best, but you know these are volunteer positions. And so the it really easy thing to do is just provide regular training so that they feel valued and, and they, they feel like they're advancing their knowledge in how to manage these resources. <clears throat> so here now I am thinking about all of this 10 years later. Um, I, I, I saw that uh, Wowie had some really great intentions, um, but it, you know, I, to this day, even though I've spoken to a lot of people who uh, worked with uh, World Vision at the time, USAID, um, and other organizations, really don't understand how things kind of fizzled out in the second phase of it, but... Um, but you know, there were a few observations and shared observations, uh, things like conflicting personalities uh, it, it did not help. Um, there, were, there were really a lack of shared goals and practice. We had those nice four key priorities, however, we didn't really cohesively work towards them. Um, and then, you know, by that time, by 2009, 2010, there's really, you know, 2009, late 2009, we wrapped up really our activities in the field at Cornell. Um, it was harder for the smaller partners to stay engaged. So, uh, it, good lessons learned, though, to, to take with us. Um, there are some really big challenges uh, with doing water resource management and, and thinking about, if you want to call them this, but NGO interventions in community development. I hate actually using that phrase. But um, climate is a big one. This is an area that's already facing uh, very devastating impacts of climate change. The UN reports that the temperatures in the Sahel are going to be one and a half times greater than the global average. And I will tell you, when I was working there, it was already 115 degrees all day. It was the hottest place. I, like it was, I always say it's Mali hot like when it's smoking hot. But um, that, that's quite devastating. And then the rains have become more erratic. Uh, they're shifting a little bit less predictable. They're, they already came down intensely over a two-month period. Now they're coming even more fiercely, or there's extended periods of drought during a time you're supposed to get rain. Even last year there was uh, heavy rain up in the Timbuktu area up north um, where Erica Steiger did a lot of work on SRI and I, I would love to know. I know that uh, a lot of rice paddies were washed out there. The political instability is important. Um, it, in all my conversations with people over the last month, uh, these three things kept coming up. Just this insecurity, the impunity, the injustice. Of, of political and military leadership um, who wouldn't take ownership of the, you know, the coup d'etat and the transition of power and um, you know, community members just really feel uh, disengaged with political processes because, because of that. <clears throat> and the security issue. Um, Oh, this is this is just huge. Um, there's very little state presence in most of the country. Mali is really big, and it has a border that's always been traditionally uh, accessible by bad actors. Who are it, it's been a traditional trade route for 
you know, thousands of years. And now you have militias, armed militias, that can camp out and be completely invisible uh, for extended periods of time until, you know, they need to move drugs or weapons and, um, and, and do maybe different ideological uh, things. So traditional conflicts, even around natural resource management, are now being uh, exploited by these armed groups and even by politicians uh, in Bamako and in some of the communities throughout the country to spark intercommunity violence. Um, one thing that was interesting, I, I learned that even where I was working in South Central Mali, and it's still to this day hard to imagine this um, based on the access that I had, but um, there, there was a, via, a truck ban in 2018 and 2019. So that meant that um, you, you couldn't drive a pickup truck. The military was controlling what kind of vehicles were on the road because of the risk of extremist violence. And so imagine being a development worker who's trying to get out to your project sites and you, you can't. So you have, to, you have to find alternative means. So imagine what that does to the progress that you're making with your partner communities. Um, I'm just about done here. Um, the, uh, the UN peacekeeping unit uh, that, that is currently there has about 15,000 personnel, about over 11,000 troops in that contingency. So um, troops coming from Chad, Bangladesh, uh, Burkina Faso, Egypt, <coughs> Senegal. The UK just sent 250 troops uh, this past year to help support. France has sent former French colonies, so France still has a lot of connections to the region for mining and, and other things. Um, they've sent quite a number of troops to help stabilize the region, but it's, it, it's a complicated, it's a very complex problem in the country right now between the insecurity and, and ongoing uh, environmental crises. So that's really paused all of the, well, not all of, but a lot, substantial amount of the development efforts that are happening across the country. And in Mali's a place that, because you don't have, the government doesn't have the resources to provide a lot of basic services, it really depends on NGO sectors to help fill those gaps, for better or worse. Um, so uh, NGOs are really treating this as a learning process. It's a very, very fragile environment and they're trying to figure out how to effectively operate in that environment and so it's been like that since 2012. So some of the uh, US AID and NGO staff I spoke to gave me this really great list of, of practices that they've ad adopted to kind of adapt to that that new environment. Um, they're, they <sighs> And they're, they're figuring this out to this day, but mostly they're just trying to work with donors who usually operate on strict timelines to be a heck of a lot more flexible, um, figuring out ways to uh, coordinate uh, more closely with traditional leadership uh, so that they can, uh, you know, use that traditional leadership to maintain momentum on projects behind the scenes when, when the NGO partners can't be uh, present in person. Uh, they're also incorporating serious security training and daily security protocols for all staff uh, working in the region. Um, there, there have been extended periods where you know, NGO staff has been, you know, the international staff pulled out of the country, but also uh, local staff who've had to stay away from project sites. So um, uh, a lot of staff who used to ride trucks to the field are now just hopping onto you know, donkey carts to get to check their project sites and things like that. So just imagine how, how much that slows it down. So um, that's, that's uh, about all I wanted to do, just give you an overview of of what uh, the really cool work that I was able to do with Cornell and all of our partners. And, and even though, um, you know, Huawei didn't 
didn't reach the, the, the point of um, the, the hopeful collaboration we all thought it was going to, do, going to be, um, a lot of really great stuff came out of it. And there were some really important lessons learned that, um, man, you know, as a PhD student going through that and seeing that um, for the first time in my life was very impactful in how I look at uh, international development to this day. So if you want to do a deeper dive, you're very curious, um, that's the dissertation. Um, it's available online with a quick Google search. And just want to thank uh, Terry and Jim and Louise for all the support they provided over the years to, to make that research happen. And, and really grateful for the USAID staff and the World Vision staff who, who did talk to me in advance of this talk. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Can we have uh, eight minutes or so for questions, uh, discussion? I'll let you. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. Thank you for that. Um, I'm curious about the incentives. I saw on one of the slides that you mentioned that there was an issue with, I guess, providing enough incentives to keep the farmer or partners engaged with the program. Um, were there any incentives that did keep serving the or engaged in the program or things that you found could have been better to keep the So glad you asked that question. Um, no, there weren't a lot of incentives granted to people. And really, right, with that example, I'm talking about water and sanitation committees, which were completely voluntary, voluntary, but still selected by uh, traditional leadership and, and NGO staff to be involved. But... Um, uh, one thing that I noticed was even more powerful than just even my research understanding incentives in development um, was just that that sense of belonging and um, you know building building your skills and be able being part of something. But if if they felt a bit abandoned by uh, their community or their NGO partners that they rely on, then what incentive do they have? Yeah. So um, uh, one of the, the best functioning water and sanitation committees I ever saw, and they were, they were so impressive. It was all because they felt really passionate about water in their community. And no matter what, they were going to drive the process forward. So I also think that that's why Thinking differently and maybe working with traditional community-based organizations isn't the, the perfect example. One, it's not a one-fit-all situation, but um, you know, finding those champions to work with is probably more important than anything else. Yeah. Thank so Thanks for the question. Hmm. question. <clears throat> what you described. Uh, in Mali, uh, uh, non-functional in water pumps and boreholes all over the place. In communities that desperately needed water, is, is not unusual. You know, I've seen it in many other places around the world. Uh, and, uh, but there's some places uh, where it, it seems to work. Uh, you mentioned uh, you know, finding champions and so on. Any other insights into uh, uh, what makes for functional uh, uh, users associations? Or, you know, I was uh, recently in Tanzania and Zimbabwe in the semi-arid areas in some part of the I, I'd say probably one out of ten pumps were actually functioning. And, uh, uh, any any thoughts or observations from other places? Yeah, other yeah. You know that is it's so tough. I because the realities we're talking about people with very little financial mean to means to to oversee the the operation and management of some of these. So um, you know to be quite honest, it has been a heavy reliance on external partners in communities like these to do that, but I, I, with some of my other work that I've done, I really feel like engaging those key champions and community members through the process 
of, of like not just coming into a community and saying we're going to drill a borehole, we're going to set up your water and sanitation committee and jet out. But um, I use this phrase a lot, but going through a process of co-creation and, and um, community investment in the process, even you know, f to, to help geophysicists with borehole siting, because I, I showed up on a site um, two years ago in Mali, or um, uh, Malawi, pardon me, and uh, w the previous year we did resistivity testing. We thought we had the four best borehole sites possible to drill and install hand pumps. But then when we came back with drill rigs, literally the day we were ready to start drilling, community members were like, well, not too keen on that, that one location. So we did it wrong. Like, and, and I know better. It was, it was my mistake. We thought we were talking to the right people, but we were not. And um, you can come in and drill as many boreholes as you want or d dig as many wells as you want. But if it's not right for the users, then you might as well just pack it up and go home because that was a waste of money. And um, so I think having, you know, community, the, the users themselves and the traditional leadership who can also um, provide some of that day-to-day -day guidance of it and the champions who will keep their community motivated by it are essential to involve from day one. And then even if they can have a little bit of financial uh, contribution to the process, I mean, even if it's them bringing bricks to help make the platforms for, for the, the um, borehole stations, even something like that, um, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Thank you for that. You mentioned that there was champions in the community that were trying to keep the project moving. Um, could you see potential for young boys who are excited about the water tip being as like your big champions? For sure. I mean, I see exactly. I mean, getting, getting youth energized is always a good thing, right? And uh, providing opportunities for them. Uh, to you know, to learn more about why protecting their local natural resources is so important, and what role they can have at a very young age. I think that would be a fabulous project. Thank you. That's a great opportunity that should have been a bullet point on there. But yeah. And then do you see any other potential like, changes in the community or like, agents of change? Because you mentioned that there was some like discomfort with some kinds of you know, morals. Did you see that there was like, a personality of the issue? Sorry, I think I'm missing the the, the um, question. Did you see any like personality trait or personality type within the communities that were always supportive? Was it just kind of very open? You know what? I think that everybody finds their passion in different ways, and I honestly I think you just find some people who a, Malians are very mobile. They, they see what's happening in a neighboring village and they bring it back to their, their community. They, they see that um, their neighbor 20 clicks down the road has a new borehole. They think, oh, well, I really like one too. And, and they're smart people. They're very innovative people, uh, just like you know, smallholder farmers around the world. And I, I really think that you know, some people just have it in them. To, they want to see they want to see certain things in their community change, and I don't I don't know what the secret sauce is about that, but like it's the same for you, right? Like, what is your passion? And um, I think if you if you feel so strongly that you don't want your children to have upset stomachs uh, all the time, or you know the elderly people in the community feeling sick every time they take water from this you know uh, hand dug well, then, you know, if that's important to you, you're going to do something about it. So finding those people is really critical. Yep. I don't want to dwell too long on the, on the uh, boreholes, but I'm interested in why they, why they were left unrepaired. And based on some of my work in the Nature Conservancy in China, different technology. I, I, I'll guess there was two reasons. One is that there were a lot of non-local parts that were going to put this together that were really expensive and impossible to get. And second was that there was no one locally um, 
talented enough to fix things up. Both of those, so I would say especially your second thought, like there are not enough people trained in the repair. So I ran into that problem all the time where you would have uh, somebody specially trained by the NGO or the, the regional water authorities who could come, but there's so many broken hand pumps and foot pumps in the region, like where do you go first? And repairing those costs a lot of money. Um, quite, a, quite a few of these boreholes were drilled by the government and you know, left without any management plan at all. And so there's absolutely no sense of ownership. I, I talk to community members about that all the time. And um, I would say that the majority of community members felt that it was either the chief's responsibility to fix it. And the chief is like, well, I had to drill that borehole and I don't have the funds. And then, or the NGO that they're working with, but the NGO's like, we didn't drill that borehole. Like, I've got other boreholes to fix. And then, um, then you know, water and sanitation committees, and it's the same thing. Treasurer doesn't know where any money is. So it's just this, you know, environment of kind of confusion and lack of ownership. And I, I see it all over the place. It's not, I'm not just talking exclusively about a place like Mali, but uh, it happens all over the place. Uh, all of those things. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time, but thanks so much, Kim. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.